Welcome to the 902 podcast, the official podcast of the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm Captain John Vick, and I want to thank you for listening. This podcast will give you an inside look at LSO with topics and guests to discuss public safety issues impacting Lancaster County. Be sure to subscribe for highlights on news, cases, and the people working for you at LSO. You can also follow us across social media at LSO Nebraska on Facebook, X, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Welcome to the 902 podcast. We are in the big studio today and uh, full house. Sheriff Terry Wagner Should I here. Recording? Chief Deputy Ben Houchin. Thanks for being here, guys. Yeah, happy Friday. Uh, return guest and Sergeant Jason Mayo. Howdy. And then we've got a couple new faces to the show. Uh, Deputy Corey Lear, Deputy Zach Meyer. Thanks for being here, guys. Yep. Thank you. The The reason we're getting together is the 20th anniversary of the Hallam tornado. And half of us in the room were working for the sheriff's office at the Hallam tornado. Uh, but the rest of us have been responded to a couple tornadoes since then. And so we're going to just kind of go through the whole gamut of, of severe weather response that uh, that we've had over the last 20 years at the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office. We had a few uh, recently, one specifically out at Waverly hit Garner Industries and uh, one about 10 years ago that, uh, that hit the, the Hickman and Bennett areas. But before we get into that, um, if, if you want to go back and, and learn a little bit more about Sergeant Mayo, you can listen to our criminal interdiction unit episode to learn uh, about all things Jason. But Corey and Zach, help us know a little bit about you guys. Where, where are you from, and how did you get to the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office? Corey, you, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I'm originally from the Crete-Kramer area, if people know where that's at. It's God's country. It's beautiful uh, this time yeah, of year. It really is. Um, I graduated high school from Crete in 2004, um, the year of the Hallam Tornado. And I eventually played football for a short time in college. Um, due to injuries, I stopped doing that. I ended up at the University of nebraska Graduated there in 2009, and I started with LSO in, well, got hired late 12 and officially started January 2nd of 13. So Corey's signed to the patrol division now, one of our canine handlers currently. Mm-hmm. Um, did you have your dog when, when, we'll talk about the the Hickman tornado on the first, did you have a dog then? Nope. I started um, as a canine handler in 2016, so okay. it's been about eight years, but that happened about three years prior. Awesome. Zach, how about you? Where where do you hail from, and how did you find your way to us? Yeah, I'm from small town southwest Nebraska, a little town called Curtis, about halfway between North Platte and McCook. Um, I graduated from Medicine Valley High School, is the name of the school there, um, in 2000. In 2001, I went into the Marine Corps, um, and I got out of the Marine Corps in uh, April of 2010, and I was an infantry machine gunner, and there was really not a lot of civilian jobs out there for <laughs> for me um so you I don't thought, say yeah, yeah. so I, I thought that uh, law enforcement would somewhat parallel my last job yeah. career and so i got into law enforcement um not knowing the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony um i really didn't know the first thing about it but i thought you know this would be worth a shot and so i tested right i mean i tested before i actually um uh, eas or got out of got out of uh, the marine corps officially um, and then got hired in, uh, let's see, August of 01. I'm sorry, August of 2010. And then, uh, yeah, December 2010, I got commissioned. And I've been essentially on patrol um, with a, sh- a short stint in courts. But, yeah, basically since 2000, early 2011, I've been on patrol. Yeah. Your, your uncle was an LPD officer? Yep, yep. My uncle Max uh, is a retired uh, LPD officer. He was a sergeant over there for many years. I think he retired in 86 or 89. I can't remember which one exactly, but, yeah. So. Cool. Yep. Well, appreciate you being here today. We're, we'll are we we'll get back to you guys in a little bit when we, uh, when we catch up with some of those other ones. But the – First one we're here to talk about today when it, when it comes to severe storms, um, and I'm just I'm reading an excerpt from this was we put this together for FEMA kind of a yes okay so we've got a a, a packet of documents because this was obviously a very big um, natural disaster and and we had a a lot of FEMA paperwork to go with it yeah if the federal government's going to pay you back you got to push a there, lot of paper that there way was, there was no paperwork reduction act apparently no. at, at this time so. Severe storms predicted throughout the region for Saturday evening, May 22nd, 2004. So we're coming up on 20-year anniversary of this event. 
and it gave ample warning to the residents of Lancaster County and neighboring counties to seek cover if needed. A tornado watch was issued. Strong winds and hail were likely in southwest Lancaster County. And um, this is the name. This is the names of the duties. I'm sorry, the names of the employees that were on duty. Uh, Sergeant Tom Trotter, deputies Derek Rollick, Chris Hillebrand, Amy Merritt, Barry Barnett, and Mike Scriven. And then we had some off-duty uniform deputies working security jobs. Um, looks like Deputy Baird was at a bowling alley. Would that have been Sun Valley? Probably back around Probably. that time. Uh, Deputy Woodruff, Woody, would have been at uh, Amigos. And then Aaron Crooks and John Osterhaus were working the Princeton Street Dance that night. They left you off that list, Jason. Yeah, that's right. They just Where were you assigned then? Hickman. Hickman? Yep. A contract deputy. A contract deputy, yeah. yeah. How long you'd been on? Since... Six December, months? December, I was oh five months out of the okay. academy. Yes, yeah, so that was my first first bid out. Oh, still trying to learn your name, probably at that point. Still yeah. trying to yeah. find Hickman when you left the office. I was there. I was there. <laughs> so the weather got worse. Uh, heavy rain, hail, high winds, lightning were prevalent. And at twenty thirty hours, dispatch began to receive calls for urgent help in Hallam. People were advising that they were trapped. Ten calls were received between twenty thirty and twenty one hundred hours. Sergeant Trotter proceeded towards Hallam and dispatched the entire shift and all off-duty deputies also. Deputy Crooks and Deputy Osterhaus were the first to arrive, being close in Princeton, and uh, advised the town had been decimated. All the third shift deputies coming on duty were dispatched to Hallam, including Sergeant Blymeister, Deputies Jerry Witte, and uh, Deputy Amy Merritt. And virtually every house and building uh, in the town of Hallam had been destroyed. Power lines were down, sewer manhole covers were missing, victims under rubble were helped, and there was one fatality victim for the tornado. We can talk about that in a little bit. And um, then we had uh, several other command staff come on duty after that. Uh, Sheriff Wagner and uh, at the time Captain George Lawners went to the sheriff's office to assist in organizing search and rescue phase. And Chief Deputy Bill Jarrett proceeded to the scene of the tornado. Initially, Norris High School was chosen as a Red Cross emergency shelter, but it was quickly learned that the school was also destroyed. Southwest High School in Lincoln was then selected as an alternative location. So, question from the audience yeah um as far as the 911 calls go in 2004 there was cell phones but were most of those come via cell phone or landline do you know yeah, I, they were knocked out so that was part of the problem their landlines were knocked out and so they got the calls were very they were cut off or not coming through but they were getting tons of like abandoned 911 type things and so it was really it wasn't making a whole lot of sense. And some of it was just out. because of the, the destruction down there, I think it screwed yeah. up the whole phone system, and that yeah. that caused some of that to occur, too, during that time. Yeah, I was just curious because I know cell phones weren't super prevalent back then like so, they are now. So you're you're coming from Hickman, Jason. Yeah. Um, you're signed as a contract deputy there. So how how did – do you even remember, like, which route you had to try to take to get there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because it, it, you could see – so from – it was not quite dark. It was about the same time of year, so it was, it was getting dark, but it wasn't okay. dark yet. And um, dispatch had kind of put out a few things and basically said it was destroyed. The only thing we heard on the radio was when uh, Aaron Crooks and John Osterhaus actually got into town, or they were able to get there quicker than everybody else. And all you could hear was wind noise, like pretty creepy, like <sighs> like that's all you could really hear from them. <clears throat> and so t- Tom Trotter told us, "Hey, everybody, go!" And I, of course, was the closest because no one was down that far. Um, so we got on seventy-seven off of Hickman Road, and I remember that the you, you couldn't see in front of you is is a rain wrapped. Everything was rain wrapped. So I mean, it's super super dark. Mm. It looked like it was midnight. Just how dark it was. Um, but as as we're going south, um, we didn't have mock then, so which is a program that you can message each other. Our we GPS had, and stuff. But we had the MDT messaging on the old CJ system on the on the computer. So um, Sergeant Herolic then was messaging me because he was coming, and we kind of said, well, hey, where are you at? Are you coming? And kind of going back and forth. But the, the road was so, or the rain was so hard, and it was blowing so hard, and there were semis that were jackknifed on 70, blowing, blowing across. Yep. Um, it took a while to get down there. Mm-hmm. But we turned, or I turned on, when I turned on Hallam Road to go west from 77, Sergeant Herolic was behind me because we had stopped on 77 because our cars were just, it was a bad storm, <clears throat> and you couldn't see anything. But So anyway, we went straight, and it got bad enough at, looking back and we went back and figured out where it was at but at 25th and Hallam um as we're going there we stopped because we couldn't see I mean nothing and it was coming down so hard and it felt like we're gonna get blown off the road and it 
it's pretty eerie. And then um, Sergeant Trotter actually got on the radio, and a big flash came, and he goes, "Well, I see the, he said, I can see the tornado, or what I think is a tornado." And he's like, "It's," and he was coming down seventy seven from Lincoln, and he goes, "It's probably at about twenty fifth and Hallam." And like me and Derek, I remember I looked up, and it, this I still see the green sign says two twenty fifth. I'm like, uh. <laughs> We got a problem. Like, this is not good. And uh, so anyway, we sat there and... You probably said it was shucks. Yeah. <laughs> said a few things. And just, <laughs> told uh-huh. Derek, we, me and him just kind of agreed, like, well, let's go because we're not going to do any good just sitting here. So we, we went in and we actually got what is now halfway through Hallam, unbeknownst to us, because it didn't look like like there was nothing. And by the time we got stopped, it's because the grain bins had been knocked over, <coughs> excuse me, and power lines. And so we had to stop. And then you kind of looked around with the lightning strikes, it, it would light up and then you kind of see the pictures from the daytime when it was all all you had was a few twi- twisted treetops and and you kind of see the grain bins where they'd fell over but i mean everything coming into town that was there before was i mean absolutely gone We're like oh man this is going to be bad and so so yeah when we got in uh, chris hillebrand was also on that shift she showed up and amy Merritt had came in first from third shift that was coming in and so us four put on our rain gear and started going um, into town to try to find people and there was a few volunteer Hallam guys that were down there and basically went house to house to house um, and it was still pouring still lightning and still pretty gnarly out but that's kind of what we did for and then we got cut off from the rest of whatever the they were blocking the roads so we got cut off from them and so all night it was us and a couple guys from Hallam and soaking wet and just f- trying to find people so I, house to house yelling for help yeah, we found there was a we got a male, female, and their young kid. They were in, I think, it was a young kid in like a, a trailer or something that had been blown over. And they, the Hallam guy came in. We they got dug out from from the rubble. And they were f- completely fine. And we found out that the Hallam residents were pretty smart because they all majority of them were at the bar already. And so they everyone holed up at the bar and then across the street at the bank, which everything had broken out windows. But those two buildings. That bar on the corner, on the northwest corner, and the bank on the northeast had kind of, they were right on the edge, and they didn't get destroyed, hmm. and everyone was in there. That Crazy. Majority of them, anyway. Yeah. Right. But how, how was radio communication through that? Was it affected, or? I don't remember it being very good. I, I just remember we kind of, we did our thing, and no one, and after fire guys got there, they kind of cut off that side of town because the power lines were down, and, and there was, you know, a lot of water and they're like this isn't safe to go over here because eight lines are sparking so some people stayed on the west or the east half of town and some stayed on the west and then kind of by the time we got done searching other groups had started to show up command staff had showed up and we kind of reorganized after four or six hours and kind of okay you guys go here let's go there and then we realized it went clear across the county so yeah um it and we're looking at uh, at some images just you know on the on the internet here that show the path but we'll put these on our social media later so people can see it. But If you want a challenging career, a career where you can make a difference in your life, your family's life, and the lives of those in your community, come and join the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office. To learn more or to apply, visit us online at www.joinlso.com. The tornado actually started down west of Dakin um, and went as far as Palmyra. Hallam was almost in the middle of that track, and at the time, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't know it that night. But the following day, I think they classified it as an F four uh, tornado, and um, winds reported more than two hundred miles an hour and a track of uh, about fifty five miles. And at the time, I think, sheriff, it was the it's, I think there's been one since, but it was the widest tornado on yeah, record. Two and a half miles wide. Yeah. And 56 miles long, yeah. And and an F4, unfortunately for the people of Hallam, right, as it was hit in town. So, um, yeah, pretty crazy stuff. So we, we, we talked about they initially chose Norris High School as kind of the the collection point or the, the reunification point, and that ended up not being the best. Yeah. Point. I, I know talking to Captain Scriven, uh, he's Deputy Scriven at the time, but um, you know he was standing on the edge of town, just trying to direct people away because I think there was so many, you know, so much congestion. And uh, it wasn't until you know hours later that he found out that Norris wasn't a great place to be sending people either. Right. It was yeah, the whole gym, old gymnasium area, and the I mean, it was 
Complete Auditorium, collapsed. Yeah, all that collapsed down. And as you drove, when it got daylight out, you could actually see. But I mean, it was, I mean, you could see that. I mean, for years, you could mm-hmm. see that path. Mm-hmm. It took all across the county, and it was just like a saw blade went through yeah. everything. Ben, what what would what was your role that night? Well, they uh, sent out, I believe, a te- our page. We used to carry pagers for the SWAT team. And uh, we got notified, and, and we are one of the groups that um, can gather quickly and get to where we needed to go. And I was the command, our team leader at that point in time. And I remember stopping off at the office thinking, you know what, I'm going to be real bright and make some copies of Hallam and so we can hand them out as we're going along and checking and uh, driving down there. And it was still storming when I was going down through there, and I can remember – uh, parking and I, it felt like your car was going to slide. It was so windy and um, and because it, it it was like three different storms went through there on that night. And uh, but I remember getting it and having the maps and just put throwing them back into my car because absolutely nothing looked the same as what it did uh, that night. Um, I can just remember you know you, you were walking around in the water like Jason said and you you were worried about. The power lines being out, you know, the, there was so much debris. I, I was just really, truly amazed we didn't have more people injured who were out just searching and doing that. And uh, my group, I was the sergeant in criminal that time, so the the one fatality we ended up working and doing that part of it. So what what happened? What happened there? Uh, you know what? She didn't make it to the. She probably stayed upstairs too long and was right at the edge of the stairway when uh the tornado hit her house and she died of blunt force trauma and just not uh just couldn't make it to the safe part of the house in time nope and Mm -hmm. i think if she could have got downstairs she would have been fine she just didn't there and she was a a little bit more elderly Mm -hmm. too so i think the time of day it ended up hitting um was a blessing because again like jason said there was more people out and a lot of people were in lincoln Mm -hmm. and so we didn't have as many people at home as what we thought but you know being through one of those storms when it's that dark out and you can't see what's coming and it it was like just it was eerie it was scary because the rain wrap it was didn't didn't know where it was at and you just remember the train. I mean, the train, the huge uh, grain elevator trains ran through there, and then that Their whole t- thing was pushed, tipped over like whole thing, yeah. like nothing. I mean, it was just like matchbox cars. Like, they were just tor- tor- turned over and all that. And you just, it was just amazing. You, you don't expect wind and all that nature to have that much power, but it took some major buildings and heavy equipment and tossed it like it wasn't wasn't anything. Well, I'm we you and I were talking a little bit when we were preparing for this and we'll talk about this with the the Waverly tornado a little bit too, but I was surprised um how many nails were on the ground, mm-hmm. you know, and like how many how many vehicle tires you go through. And uh so and you, Ben, you were saying that somebody actually just had to like run tires down. Yeah, they, you know, when we were talking to Captain Scriven now, yeah, he was talking about cuz we you'd try to do security at that time cuz we you know we were down there forever. I'm, it seemed like you know five or six months afterwards uh, doing security at that location. And yeah, boy, if there was a nail to be found, our tires found them. And uh, mm. yeah, we were going through them quickly down there. Sheriff, how about how about you? What was May twenty second, oh four, like on your side of the house? Well, um, I had flown in from uh, Frankfurt, Germany. Oh, that day, uh, I'd been down in Kosovo on a boss lift uh, with the uh, with the National Guard. And got into town, and a friend of mine, I was just beat. Uh, you know, we'd gained eight hours flying back to the U.S., and so I, I don't know what time it was in my by my clock, but anyway, I was beat. But my friend, uh, a friend of mine's daughter got married, and we were going to, to the reception, which was in Memorial Stadium, up on third floor of Memorial, West Memorial Stadium. So we went down there, and all of a sudden the rain starts coming, and then my phone goes off, and it was Bill Jarrett. And he said, Helen's, Helen's been hit by a tornado. I'm going down there. Why don't you go to the office and, and uh, help with the, the phones and such? And so I did. And it was uh, it was a nightmare. So I, I had lived in Helen for about a year when I was 10 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, my grandparents lived there up, up until they passed. So I was very real familiar with Helen. And I remember the news calling and saying, you know, how many houses are damaged? And I said, I don't know. I'll check. So I called Bill, and I, and I said, how many houses are damaged? He goes, all of them. 
I said, that is not possible. <laughs> and he said, no. He said, I am not BSing you at all. They are all destroyed. And so, uh, you know, I think there was one house there by the by the church on the north side there, north of the bar, or north of the barn, or the the bank, yep. that pretty much was unscathed. And I don't know how, um, but the, every other house in town was pretty much There's, demolished. Yeah, some of the newer, and when I say newer, like 30-year-old house, that just newer builds, they weren't flattened. Yeah. But they were the exception for sure. Yeah. Um, compared to all the other houses. I mean, yeah, and, you know, the downtown area, the bank, gone. and the, uh, the Hitch and Post uh, bar that you talked about, and I think that old mobile station across the street yep. were the only three buildings still standing in that downtown area. Yeah, they're they pretty much gone. So we're looking we're looking at a picture here, and again, we'll put some of these online, but there's kind of like we've got our four-wheeler and a couple of cruisers mm-hmm. and military vehicles. So was this looking down, basically kind of the main drag in Hallam then? I believe that's looking west. Yeah, that's yeah. looking yeah, west. Yeah, looking west from on Main Street. Yeah, I mean on Hallam Road. Yeah, I I was not there that night, but just from what I know of Hallam now, I, it'd be it'd be tough to figure out where you're at. Oh yeah, well, and, I, you, and you see those trees in this photo, how they're all just they're just matchsticks. I mean, yeah. just they're defoliated and uh, just uh, splintered, and that's the way every tree in town was. So. So we yeah, you can see the Main Street sign bent over on there. Yeah, but, um, yeah Main Street there. Yeah. yeah. So we we kind of had two sheriff's offices then for several months. Right? Well, what we did was, and and uh, Ben alluded to this a little bit. You know, we had the the security detail. Um, we we had some help from the National Guard, but uh, we went into our emergency staffing mode. We've only done that a couple of times in my career where. Deputies are working 12 hours on, 12 hours off, no days off, and no uh, no vacation, um, and no holidays. I mean, it was, um, that's the way it was, and we... All man on deck. All, all men, yeah, everybody uh, was needed, and we had, uh, you know, we had the town to sort of seal off at, at night, so, and we had a curfew from midnight, you know, I mean, from darkness to dawn, and... Um, you know, we had a couple of people try to sneak into town on the tracks, um, that, you know, that got uh, got arrested. But uh, for the most part, we didn't we didn't suffer any looting. I think the issue, I mean, the issue that I remember being on patrol then and working the 12 on 12 off it, Hallam, they did a pretty good job because the state uh, state patrol helped out too. Um, National Guard was there. But then just the broad swath across the county, yeah. the issue was, you know, how do you protect all these residents' uh, properties when they, one, can't stay there? They're not going to be there at night. Yep. There's... Unfortunately, people right. take advantage of that situation, knowing that, and then the the path was so wide. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, it was when it was on nights, twelve on twelve off, and then you just basically run that path um, back and forth across the whole county. Um, Crazy, yeah. Well, that night too, trying. You know, we had Hallam, which we knew of, but we yeah. there was so many acreages we had to try to go f- figure out and make sure everybody was right. okay and. Yeah. You don't realize even back then, and there'd be even more now, um, mm-hmm. but there's a ton of houses and ton of residents that we had, were trying to knock on doors and make sure they're okay and all that. So prior to Hallam, Sheriff, I mean, had there been any other big tornado disasters, you know, in, in your time here at the office? No. Okay. So no. this was this kind of the... This was the first one. For, yeah. for many people. You know, I mean, huge snowstorms where sure. it was blocked in, but nothing uh, that created the damage yeah and the devastation that the helm tornado created so i'm going to fast forward a little bit we'll talk about a few of these um because for like Corey and zach and i that that came into the picture a little bit later i mean hallam was kind of i mean we knew of it you know i mean there's pictures hanging on the wall and stuff and historical stuff so it's kind of um office history a little bit just all the stuff that happened there so about 10 years later uh we found ourselves i I think it was my first night um, as a supervisor on third shift. Yep. And, you, you know, you guys were old hat by then, so you knew what you were doing, and I was just trying to figure it out. So, um, Corey, wh- what were you assigned that night? Do you remember? Were you District 1? I was a Hickman deputy. Or you were the Hickman. Yep, okay, I was so. was direct deputy. And then, Zach, were you a district on that I one? was a district, but I don't remember what district I was. Yeah, we ended up kind of all over. I was probably District 1. 
Okay. I would assume southeast. Looks so, like they're south on that call for service. Yeah, so this is October 3rd, 2013, so almost 10 years after Hallam. And, Corey, you, you tell the story best because, you know, here I am just trying to be helpful. Um, but then, uh, then but I, I turned thing. into – I turned into I was a sergeant at the time, but kind of Captain Obvious. So, <laughs> Well, <clears throat> it kind of all started with we started getting a lot of the abandoned 911s or the residential alarms just from the wind and the rain. And – we were i was kind of running around trying to clear those up and stormy stormy night you know yep very but stormy night very weird dark. for october yep very very heavy rain started to hail and i was sitting in my cruiser getting ready to go find the next alarm at the dental office in hickman when they advised on the radio that a confirmed tornado was on the ground in hickman <laughs> so it was a little eerie you knowing i'm sitting there i have no idea how close to this tornado on the ground but um, then Sergeant Vic was nice enough to advise to me on the radio that w- it would appear I'm sitting in the eye of the storm at the current moment. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good to know how much yeah, I can I do think, about that. I think the, res- the response was something like, yeah, I, uh, I know. I'm here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, it, it, once that had kind of passed it, the air cleared a little bit. You kind of see where you're going. The main issue was the path it kind of took through Hickman was really not in town, but it was across the southeast corner. So about 96th and Hickman Road, um, right near Wagon Train Lake is where it hit. There's a few houses um, on the south side of Hickman Road, west of 96th, and then a few on the west side of 96th, south of Hickman Road. And then it went through Wagon Train Lake. But um, about the half mile line between 82nd and 96th is where we start hitting big trees covering the road yeah so that's where cruiser stayed and got out on foot and just started running door to door and checking but yeah and you you kind of came down a little bit probably after Corey, then zach zach and brad i think got you, there not too long after yeah you had told us to stay at home and stay sheltered because we were kind of hunkering down for a while i was sitting in my basement you know in the storm shelter when that all went through and then the call started coming that yeah. There was damages to homes, and so I left from essentially the Denton area and drove over to, to the lake area. And um, Yeah, we started a grid search, essentially. Mm-hmm. The command post set up a map, and all the deputies in the patrol cars drove, um, kind of trying to follow the path of what we thought the path of the tornado was. And um, it was, I guess, pretty easy to tell where the damage was and essentially just get out and check on the, the people and all the acreages and mm-hmm. stuff around the area um and well, yeah and i ben i think you were in that night probably here with a big map and oh, I, I went to i went to bennett and we had that and yeah we the, were marking the things fire the just calling off address the command post. as we checked them yep. and, yep. and when it was because i think i was the command i was this captain of patrol yep. during yep. that one so and i i remember you know one of the biggest things we were worried about houses you can you know you know where the houses are at so you can check them but it hit the east side of the lake where the campground was at and I remember there there was that that one camper that got flipped over, and so we're worried like, oh man, how many how many of these other ones were in here? Fortunately, it was in October, and it turned out that there really weren't that many. Yeah. But yeah, it got rolled like on end. Yeah, yeah. There was pieces it, of camper and no people, so it was it, concerning yeah. until yes. we figured out that well, we didn't have people to search for. And if I remember correctly, that some of the tent campers went into the outhouse. Yep. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the outhouse got removed from its foundation. Which is about all you had yeah. out there. And the only so. thing that was left was the vent pipe. Mm-hmm. Um, and you guys had to kind of go in there on foot into part of the campground, right? Yeah, just because large trees and debris blocking the entrances. So most of it was on foot, trying to get in and out and see if we had any injuries in there. Um, there was a couple homes. I remember one on the south side of Hickman Road, just west of 96, that had a really large oak tree that was thrown right through the garage and sticking into the home and ran up and started hollering out for anybody and an elderly male stuck his head out through the hole in the mm-hmm. side of the garage next to the tree and said we're good so it was a lot of that it was just running around doing our best to check on people see if they needed help and and deputies too that needed our help mm-hmm. um we had a couple yeah. we'll we'll just we'll remove their names sheriff to protect the innocent but uh but we had a, a couple people get stuck that night and Michael Hips. Uh, if you, if yeah. you weren't, weren't going to do it, I was. So. I, I, I picked him up, and he rode along as my A driver for the rest of the, the evening. Yeah, that's that's always, you know, Mike was a newer deputy at the time. Um, not that Mike is new to gravel roads or dirt roads in that case, but I think Mike found a dirt road that night that he thought was a gravel road, and uh, his, his car... It was stayed. until he got over the hill and yeah. the gravel ran out. Yeah, his, his car stayed right there for quite a while, long enough to long enough for us to get a picture of it, and it sat on the lineup computer for quite a while to uh, 
you know, just a little in 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 house shaming there. So. Yes. Hey, I'm Captain John Vick with the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office. When it comes to your career, don't settle for good enough. Don't settle for ordinary. We won't either. Be different. Be better. Be exceptional. Start your future today at joinlso.com. You know, the, these nighttime storms, though, are so much... They're all bad. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, you know, the one that just occurred here that hit Garner, at least afterwards it starts to get light again and you have that because i can just remember hallam and, and the one down by hickman it was such a pain because you're fighting the dark there's no street light mm-hmm. i mean it just changes the game and it makes it so much more difficult um to work through it and make sure everybody's okay yeah and, and fortunately i mean there were some people that obviously suffered damage and it's terrible for them but but fortunately we dodged a bullet i mean we were driving down there we're we just think of Hallam because that's what we know, you know, and you think of those pictures and everything, but thank God it wasn't, uh, wasn't that bad. So, um, then we'll fast forward again, another 10 years, just up to this year. And I, you know, it, it was not on my bingo card to have a, uh, tornado hit Lancaster County this year, but, um, there we were on, uh, August 26th, April, April, or, I'm sorry, April 26th. And, uh, we're at least the the three of us. We're sitting right here. I had taken the day off. Oh, you weren't you weren't here. Sarah was here. That's right. Right. Yeah. I, I take the day. Same off. Same thing. Yeah. Ben and I were Ben and I were in here at least. So um, recording a podcast. We were with our newest deputies. <laughs> and you know, I hate to you hate to say it, but you, you, we're in a tornado watch. And then we're in a tornado warning and. What what do you do in Nebraska sometimes? You go outside. We, we went outside. We were outside. looking for it. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. uh-huh. it because it, it was at two thirty. Yeah, it was. It, yeah, it two, was early. Three thirty. Right at second shift lineup. Two thirty. Three thirty. Right three 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 three. So most people are at work. We're at work. Um, it, and it's okay. Well, do I have to go outside? Do I not have to go outside? I remember we had the National Weather Service was on um, on the show here earlier this year, and Becky Kern said that they've done some research, and apparently most people need like two sources of confirmation before they take a warning seriously like i gotta hear it on my phone um but then i gotta see it you know see it outside or i gotta have somebody call me and tell me that there's actually a tornado here so um (laughs) we were kind of just waiting here i mean i think we we hunkered down back in 2013 but i remember we were kind of joking about well why why are we hunkering down for this like it's the sun's shining outside until um then we we got a call the garner industries got wiped out and um, I think Zach, you were up north. I was. I was just south of Branch Oak Lake. Yeah. So you kind of saw this thing roll in. Well, yeah, and we were getting the updates that it was on, you know, West Van Dorn, West Pioneers, and then it was up in Air Park, and I was facing south, watching it. Yeah. And but it was just, it was just a big black cloud. I couldn't tell that it was a tornado. I mean, they said they confirmed that it was, but I'm like, ah, no, it's not. And mm-hmm. so I just kept watching it. And believe it or not, I didn't switch over to Channel 1 when everybody else did. And then I started hearing people going code and, and to Waverly. And so, and of course, my MDT had kicked me off. Um, so I had to re-log on to figure out exactly what was going on. But These are the real-life things that happened. Yeah, yeah. But I had already started heading, heading east um, at that point to go to Raymond. Yep. And then it started you know, hailing on me just east of Raymond. And then I figured out what was going on, and I decided to to hightail it there as well but i yeah so i i went to 14th and raymond and as soon as i hit 14th and raymond and looking back at my camera i could see it at raymond i could see the tornado at raymond i just didn't know what i was looking at yeah and then when i got to 14th and raymond i could see the funnel cloud um and so i turned and went to waverly road and cut across on waverly road and came down 98th street but i could see the tornado moving off northeast Mm -hmm. um and they were giving updates trying to give updates on it and stuff and i think everybody was coming from the office and i showed up around the same time but i aside from you i was the only one that came in on 98th street from the north yeah Corey and i were here at the office and we we hopped in the cars and and headed out you you went straight up highway six right I did. When <clears throat> we're on I-180 going north out of Lincoln, you could almost see that it was on the interstate at the time. So that's the first time I've seen, like, I'm driving towards this tornado. I mean, you see them on TV and stuff, but that first time I've seen one on the ground, 
with yeah. debris and all, you know, all the things. That's yeah. the first one I've yeah. ever seen. Yeah. You know, the one thing, too, is I remember listening and people were saying, oh, it's at 33rd and uh, Superior. Well, I think that's where they were at reporting yeah. that the tornado was. and Because I was thinking, oh, my gosh, if it's on the ground there, we're going to have we got, we we got got some major problems that, going they on. They briefly had said maybe one down in Havelock, too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Right. ended up not being true, but... I think there was probably some rotation, but there wasn't actually anything on the ground yet. Jason, were you and your crew on that day? I, well, I heard that come out, and I was like, Zach, I was kind of up north. I'm like, well, this is going to be bad because it's normally like it's going to come up around where I'm at. So I went to try to get stuff put out, and I told my guys to go the other way, mm-hmm. to stay out of the way. And one of them, uh, Hinkle, didn't listen. He's like, well, I just got to go to the office what? real quick for something. I'm like, well, don't go to the office because I'm looking at Channel 8 right now, and they're or yeah. Rusty Dawkins is telling me that thing's right over the yeah. office. I mean, that whole black. Yeah. Yep. I go, it's not a good area to be. And then 10 minutes later, he calls me, and all I hear is, wing, wing, wing. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and go, I see three tornadoes. I'm going. I'm like, okay, well, it's your fault. Yeah, it uh, it got pretty wild. So, um, Zach, you, you got there from the north, and, Corey, you drove straight in. I think I heard you guys were a little ways ahead of me, and I heard that Highway 6 was just jammed with traffic. So I that's when I doubled back, and I came around and followed you in from the north. Um, but, you know, the first thing I remember seeing was that meatball of a car that kind of got tossed just north of the intersection there, and we were worried that, you know, yeah. whether there was somebody in it or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I pulled up, you couldn't go south of the tracks on 98 because there was power poles and cars and debris. Um, and when I first pulled up, other deputies had already been checking, but they were looking, along with citizens, looking for the driver's occupants of that mm-hmm. that vehicle. And then it dawned on us that it probably came from the parking lot yep. of Garner Industries. Um, but, yeah, so then I ended up having to take the ditch and go to get on to, um, you know, Highway 6 and then up to Garner Industries. Everybody else went on foot, but that was a lot of work, so I drove up there. Yeah, so <laughs> I well, – Smart. Yeah. <laughs> I, you get, I think Corey, I know you were one of the first ones, you know, in the, in the building there trying to get to people. Um, cause we had some people trapped originally. There was one. Yeah. One. Um, cause the South side of the building really took the, took it on the chin, mm-hmm. um, had a pretty big, pretty big collapse. And I think that, that was the point where, when we realized, Oh, okay, this is, this is going to be bad. Um, kind of thinking mass casualty incident at that point. Yeah. When I first got there, there's obviously debris everywhere, but there's a lot of people on that East lawn. Mm -hmm. Um, some of them had some minor injuries were bleeding them, but nobody looked to be seriously hurt, but we kind of just started trying to get, if we had a manager present, tell Mm -hmm. them to get everybody grouped up and start getting us a head count. Right. Um, to find out how many we had in the building. And one of them said she was a incident manager for the company and, said they had one trapped he was behind a cinder block wall in between a cinder block wall that had fallen into the foundation wall of the building so he was trapped between the two yeah it was actually a concrete it was a concrete or sorry yeah, ceiling con- yes that collapsed and fell down and looked like a oh, wall. wow yeah like a preform mm. kind of deal yes and it had fallen and i was talking to one of the other guys who was trying to get him out and he had they had gotten the all clear okay um, and so he had walked out of a door to a open air covered you know whatever uh, patio area and and just to take a look and then it collapsed and essentially it didn't squish him it just trapped him between the ceiling you know the concrete ceiling and then the the wall man um just outside of the door that he just came out of he had about you know a couple feet of triangle space at the bottom that he mm-hmm. crouched into right when it happened and yeah mm-hmm. hey he was just fine he just yeah. couldn't get out well i I, t- I like i said i was not at hallam but um running up to that building made a believer out of me i mean because that's that's some that's concrete i mean steel uh roof supports i mean a lot of twisted metal and uh talk about the gas oh yeah well but go back to the building for a minute you know if if anybody's familiar with those concrete tilt up walls Mm -hmm. tilt up i mean that's the construction that we're talking about here with garner industries super well-built building and um you know, to see what the tornado did to to those concrete walls and, of course, the ceiling, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. steel trusses, they were all out in the middle of Highway 6, and, yeah, just just a darn mess there. So it was amazing uh, that a building I thought would be absolutely secure mm-hmm. in its four walls was not. Yeah, yeah. And there was vehicles tossed all over the place, and we had one in the pond, and yep. Um, so they were that one. I'm yeah. sure did come from the parking lot, but they were tossed all over the lawn. I just I joked with my wife. I'm, I was joking. Do not try this at home, kids. But the 
you know, we, we knew there was weather coming and uh, it was going to be around the time I was driving home. And so I, I just said, ah, well, you know, car is probably about the second safest place to be other than your basement, you know. And uh, that's that not true, by the way. Yeah. And uh, not, even <laughs> not even close. But I, I had joked about it and then I stopped joking about it um, when I saw what it did to those cars because uh, that, yeah, that was crazy. Which wow. is why I was nervous in Hickman when you told me I was in the eye of the storm yes. in my car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just to back up a little bit, I just kudos to the the Garner management because oh, when man. we got yeah. there, they were all staged, you know, east of the building on the lot there, and they were working on head counts already. And by the time I got up to the building to start looking for people, they had said that they were missing two. Mm-hmm. Um, the one guy, obviously, we had located. Yep. Um, we just were working on trying to get him out, and the other gentleman happened to clock out early and was gone that day so they had they knew that we were looking for two people and it didn't take long to find one and then figure out the other one wasn't in the building at all and yeah in hindsight after talking to them the main portion of the collapse of that building is where everybody was and so they crawled out of wires and twisted pipes and it mm. was just and for nobody to get hurt worse than they did was that's incredible mm-hmm. well they had a good plan yep yeah. They followed it. They went to their safe zone. Um, you know, you just can't hardly ask for. Yeah, the, like, the veranda here is not a safe zone. Yeah, no. luckily they didn't do what a lot of people do: go out and look at it. Yeah. Well, so the so the south side of the building, like we said, definitely took the the brunt. Uh, but the north side of the building was still kind of intact. So that's where um, we were directing units, and that's where I started. At least that initial kind of command post was right at the front door because we were trying to get people in and, and check on accountability. Um, but Corey, you know probably worse than any of us. You made it. You know, a couple hundred feet in that building, and uh, all of a sudden, the there was a natural gas leak hitting you in the face. You could hear it and about taste it when you got towards yeah. the far west end. Yeah. Um, it, I, I don't know exactly where it ended up being leaking from, but as we were after we got the gentleman that was trapped out, we started clearing the building to make sure we didn't have anybody else in there. And the farther you got to the west, you could feel your throat starting to scratch and your eyes burning, and yeah, it was leaking pretty heavy in there. So I, we obviously with Terry, you train shutting the gas off at houses and stuff and so i went and found somebody that was a oh maintenance guy i guess and asked where the gas shut off would be and i asked if it could be shut off the crescent wrench because we didn't have our gas tool mm-hmm. and i carry a crescent wrench in my car so i went and got it and he took me over there um and i tried to shut it off initially with him which in hindsight after watching how they turned the gas off probably wasn't the greatest idea in the world but um i figured it was better to get it shut off now instead of you know the whole building to explode from whatever um, so we went over there, tried to shut it off, and then I found out that it was actually broke off uh, just above ground level um, below the shutoff valve. So mm-hmm. I didn't think I was doing any good. And then a while later, I went back over there and sh- actually shut the valve off so at least it would stop pumping gas into the building and it mm-hmm. was all outside, mm-hmm. open air. Um, so, yeah, we did shut it off. It just didn't do anything. And you could hear it hiss, I mean, wow. for, for an hour or two. Wow. I mean, it, it what, took what, him a while. What did that gas guy say? That normally, I'm going to say it's like 7.5 pounds or, yeah, se- 75 PSI or something. It's like 175 pounds yeah. per square inch. I mean, yeah, said, high pressure gas. Line. It's in that industrial kind of factory area there along Highway 6. And Yeah, um, he said that was the highest one he's ever shut off. Yeah, so it was. And he'd uh, been there a while. I, I just I remember when you know we were yelling inside the building and we weren't hearing a whole lot, and that's kind of when you're you're tasting that gas and <laughs> looking around, and you're seeing wires and you're starting to wonder, you know, maybe being inside this building is not such the best idea. Anymore. Well, that so, and keying up on your radio may not yeah, be the best idea. Yeah, either. that's what the well, maintenance guy said. He goes, "Don't use any electronics." <laughs> yeah. So we we got everybody boogied out of there, and uh, I, once we felt a little better about accountability, I will own. The fact that I briefly fired up a chainsaw to try to cut a hole in the wall to get the guy out, <laughs> well, and as soon as I got started, we were like, "Wait a second, this is a this is a bad choice." So. It, yeah, if uh, we didn't we didn't want any more sparks in there than we than we yep. already had, so lit up your cigarette and thought about it. Hey, <laughs> yeah, I, I can damage <laughs> that saves one life, chainsaw. Jason. But uh, we, that that w- that was the crazy thing, though. That uh, you know, we were I think we were driving up there all expecting that we were going to find fatalities, and mm-hmm. we never did. Well, there was what seventy I, people yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Yep. And I mean, honestly, yeah, you looked at that and you're like, there, there is no way mm-hmm. all 70 of them got out. Yeah. So um, crazy, crazy day. Um, you know, Bennington, Blair, Omaha, Elkhorn, um, they kind of had a, a a little bit of a howl after that. You know, they had yep, yeah. neighborhoods just wiped out. And uh, so we're certainly fortunate that that, uh, that that didn't happen here in Lancaster County. But uh, sad, sad day for 
for all those folks up there. Um, I've got a um, colleague from Omaha PD that his house got destroyed. So um, just a sad deal all around. But it, I, I guess it just goes to show all the way from Hallam to the Hickman tornado to this one that hit Garner Industries. These things don't happen all the time, but sometimes it takes them happening to to remember that you're not completely invincible to these things. It certainly certainly uh, made a believer out of me um, when it came to that stuff. And Jason, obviously being in, being in Hallam, you probably didn't need too many reminders to. Yeah, I don't try to follow them around if I can help it. it yeah, I, just I know what they can do. It's just seeing that, seeing the damage. It's like you're just more careful. Like Zach said, if you can see it and see where it's going, that makes mm-hmm. you a little more comfortable. But those. The rain wrap, dark, dark ones, that, that's still pretty oh. eerie. Form. There was a lot of actual storm chasers that got caught up in that one. And yeah, I, I think I, I've kind of always thought that that was to go stand on the porch and watch it and or drive out and watch it, follow it a little bit. But well, and, and it changes so fast that y- yeah, yeah it was it was binging back and forth. You yeah. just did not know where it was going to go. Yep. Although it, although it wasn't, um, you know, directly related to the storm, we did have a fatal crash that day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I think, as I understand it, it was a couple people that were out, you know, um, not like uh, not formal storm chasers or anything. Just but they, they were out watching the weather. Yep. And um, and yeah, unfortunately, got in, involved in the crash. There are a lot of people out moving around and um, got in a crash that day and, and lost their lives. So sad, sad deal for that. But. That came out um, right as we were getting on scene, and I remember, I mean, just thinking, we don't, State Patrol was busy on the interstate, because the interstate got hit. Um, we were obviously very busy in, in that area, because we weren't sure how big of a deal we had, and I remember having to call for just out-of-county help to, to get to that. Fortunately, we had a deputy that could, that could uh, spring loose, but... Yeah, the know. one thing I was really impressed, and I've been impressed on all of these incidents, is, is people were calling in. Several deputies yep. saying, hey, I can come in and I can work. They're off duty and mm-hmm. they take it upon themselves to say, hey, I'm available and do it. And and as you know, during Hallam, it, it was all, Sim- Sim- all on deck. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah. even bigger on that part. And uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody uh, willingness to come in and do that because you run out of people really quick, especially mm-hmm. when you have two major incidents. Well, and I think this last tornado, you know, it hit right at lineup time. So you're, yep. we're talking... First shift is, you know, with an hour of going home, second shift just coming on, and then you called in third shift early. So, you know, we had we had our, all three shifts on duty to help deal with that situation and and then and then it stabilized pretty quickly. Uh it did. Able mm-hmm. to send the third shift guys home and try to get a couple more hours of sleep before they had to come back in. But yeah, yeah, I don't I don't know how you wind down and go back to sleep after that. Probably probably didn't happen for two weeks. We many had a couple that came in on their days off too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But the city did a great job of helping out yeah, with did. everything, with traffic, yeah. and then yep. obviously NSP knew that we were tied up with Garner, and they went and yeah. worked on the interstate because we had semis tipped over on the interstate, causing other crashes. I think they had, what, three or four crashes right there on the interstate. Well, that and the train went over. and <laughs> Well, Zach and I pulled up next to We didn't know it at the time, but there was that train stopped on the tracks just, yeah. just east of, of where we got to the scene, yep. and it was a couple days later that that video went viral of there was a conductor in the train yeah. As the tornado was going over him, just yeah. absolutely wild. That, that is a safe vehicle to be in. That it. would probably twenty thousand pounds. Yeah, about yeah. safe as a house. Yeah, um, but yeah, you mentioned it too. Um, Mike Woolman, captain of the LPD, was yeah. super helpful. Um, brought people out from uh, from East Lincoln, and, and they completely just took the traffic thing, so our deputies could focus on the on the actual incident. Um, and so, they they really paid the price of yeah. tires. <laughs> um, I don't more, think we lost we one, and I think they had four or five cruisers with uh, at least two or three, and some, <laughs> one of them had all four tires down. Yeah, so I mean, you mentioned it in Hallam, and this this it's just those little things you don't think about that uh, all that debris that has to go somewhere. And when you watch the videos of it getting thrown up in the air, I mean, it uh, yeah, there was just nails and, and yep. just stuff everywhere. So, well, um, I, I just really appreciate you guys taking time to walk through that. Not everybody gets to. Uh, walk into a tornado scene um every day and even even us that are first responders we don't get to walk into it every day but uh about 10 years right in between these so how yeah. 20 years ago um the the hickman wagon train tornado about 10 and then just recently we had the one that hit garner so you know, and if you look back before that 1980 mm-hmm. um locust street in grand island was hit yeah the about 19 so the night of the night of the twisters out there when they had several hit grand island 1972 i think l street in omaha 72nd and l got mm-hmm. hit real bad 
So, yeah, about every 10-year cycle, there's a, yeah something bad happens. Yeah, well, uh, appreciate you guys taking the time. Appreciate what you do, um, you know, tornado season or not tornado season. But you guys do a hell of a job, and we appreciate it very much. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Yep, thanks. That is all the time that we have for today's episode of the 902 Podcast. We appreciate you listening in. Be sure to check out all of our episodes on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. Be sure to like and follow so that you don't miss out on any of our upcoming episodes or so that you can find some of our episodes from the past to go back and listen to again. If you have any questions about hiring opportunities at the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office, be sure to check us out, joinlso.com, where you'll find information about how to be a deputy or about all of the other offerings that we have for civilian professional staff positions here at the office. Also, you can find us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, which is now X, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. We're LSO Nebraska on all of those platforms. And lastly, if you would like to send us an email, you can reach out to lso at lancaster.ne.gov. Thanks again for listening.